gates of hell and hell rifts. While a gateway is often built to protect against invaders, there are few mortals to whom the gates of hell would be closed. The evil that lies beyond will welcome almost any soul who voluntarily enters. If that soul is still clothed in a physical form, the flesh of that body will be stripped and rendered to adorn the walls which are strung with the dismantled remains of innumerable victims. Cracks and fissures in the uneven ground around the gates exhale a poisonous miasma, the rank effluvia of unspeakable filth and degradations. The deafening wails, screams, and roars that stab the ears can cause madness in the same moment they are first heard. The ramparts seem to rise to the height of mountains, built of stone on which are carved repulsive and forbidden runes, as though each rock received its own curse as it was laid. The gates of iron were built to withstand the onslaught of angels and to cause the heavens to quake. They stand with cruel defiance that would gladly see the entire world destroyed before suffering defeat. But they are not the only gates to the only hell. Many of us walk through more subtle portals into our own personal hells, often without realizing it until it's too late. Once there, we do not need demons to torture us, for we do that to ourselves with implements such as shame and self-hatred. No one can free us, and those who love us can often only stand by and watch as we suffer as though we have dragged them with us into the hells of our making. I would like to believe that if all the gates to all the hells were as terrible and obvious as the gates of the burning hells, no one would walk through them. Yet, I know there will always be souls so lost they feel unworthy of any other place. There is a verdant garden of hope in the high heavens, the domain of the Archangel Oriel. Flowers bloom there eternally, scenting the air with soft perfume while music fills the soul with celestial harmonies. Mortals who have experienced the beauty of this garden describe an almost intoxicating tranquility, one in which the mind can become lost, forgetful, complacent. Perhaps that is why Diablo, empowered as the prime evil, chose the Garden of Hope as an entry point during a siege against the High Heavens. By opening Hell Rift there, he used our hope against us. I wonder, can a demon's mind see hope as anything but a weakness? It seems Diablo thought our hope would be our undoing, and it almost was. So perhaps the prime evil was not entirely wrong in his strategy. It was only by the strength of the Nephilim that the Hell Rifts were closed, and Diablo was defeated, saving creation once again. But what if the Nephilim had failed? It is best not to hope. You must always have hope. I will only say this, take hope as nourishment when needed, but do not subsist on it alone lest you become drunk on his reassurance and made vulnerable by its promises. To hope for salvation while doing nothing, to attain it, brings only ruin. The rebellion in hell that saw the prime evils exiled to the mortal plane also left them incorporeal. For any of the three to take physical form now requires a body for their spirit to possess. Over time, the presence of the demonic entity will corrupt the victim's human flesh, twisting it into a grotesque simulacrum of the prime evil's physical form. When this abomination is defeated or destroyed, the entity is banished once again from the material world, leaving behind whatever remains of its dead and mangled shell. Just as some venerate and utilize the teeth or fingers or femur of a sanctified corpse, so others make use of the profane leavings of demons. When I consider these relics and their uses, I cannot help wondering if anything of the human host does remain hidden deep within them. When the Horodrum exploited the magical properties of an object, like the Horn of Diablo, did its power come from the demon's essence, or did it arise from a lingering residue of the host's righteousness, however faint? 
Or is it perhaps the combination that matters? The synthesis of nature that once granted the firstborn their tremendous power? The Lord of Hatred left this gelatinous relic behind. Many think hatred sits in the heart, but it begins in the mind. With thoughts and stories whispered into our ears, like worms that wriggle and gnaw their way inward and leave us infested. Mephisto's brain reminds us that all are vulnerable to the corrupting influence of hatred, even those who believe they are engaged in righteous work. The Eye of Baal was a ghastly reminder of what the Lord of Destruction saw when he looked at our human world and what he wanted to do with it. I was not at the barbarian city of Setsharon when Baal laid siege with his armies, though I have read accounts by the few survivors of that assault. They describe the prime evil atop his litter, surveying the city with ravenous malice and an insatiable lust for destruction. His vision for sanctuary was of a wasteland stained with blood. Diablo's horns are sharp enough to pierce and gore, though anyone so injured would be wise to pray the wound is swiftly fatal. If not, the tainted gash will fester and rot from the inside out, giving the body of the injured over to maggots and hellish parasites long before death ends the feverish agony. Diablo's whole body bristles with vicious, bony spikes. Even the relic of one of his lesser horns would be enough to cause terror. I have put off talking about this subject long enough, and I should know better. I have enough experience with pain to have learned that suffering is made worse by attempts to avoid it. In this moment, it is the memory of Donan's death that I resist. In our quest to stop Lilith, we travel through a gateway in the ancient city of Chaldeum into the burning hells. The darkness there can be as difficult to describe as the blinding light of the high heavens. The mind can scarcely comprehend the gruesome blasphemies encountered, and I hope no other mortal will ever be called to venture there again. But if that should be your path, I urge you to remember that the very walls are alive with malice. We had taken shelter in a small cavern, the dank air in that chamber clung to us with the smells of a charnel house and a fetid swamp. Ranks of tall columns surrounded us. At one point, Donan heard wet, squelching movement in the shadows, and he recklessly, foolishly, went to investigate alone. He discovered that the pillar standing over us had been sculpted from demonic tissues and animated by foul magic. They uncoiled tendrils lined with teeth and jagged bards. One of these feral claws ripped into Dona's belly, a mortal wound, but he lived long enough to warn us of the danger. Had he not found the strength to endure until then, we might have perished with him. All would have been lost. As it was, the fight cost us dearly. I wish now I had paid more attention to what Dona was doing. I wish I had urged him to be more cautious. Such thoughts are the self-torture of memory. And I suspect he would have ignored me. I have come to believe that Dona's grief at being preceded to the grave by his wife and son may have led some part of him to seek his own death. Skosklund this land is haunted in a way that I have not felt in other regions of sanctuary. In the middle of the night, unearthly wailing can be heard off in the cold mists that shroud the moors. Werewolves stalk the gloom beneath the dense forests. Khazra goatmen gather to waylay travelers and raid unprotected settlements. Amidst these threats, the druid colleges hold fast, bulwarks against the encroaching wilds. At Tuldulra, the greatest of the colleges, there is an ancient oak tree named Glor An Fida. The druid reverence of this tree speaks to their deep connection with the other than human world. Were it not for the influence of hell, perhaps those who call Skothglen home could live in greater harmony with the other beings who share this land. There is a painting hanging near me in Donan's study. It depicts him with two druids, 
Aerida, and the Thane. He was undoubtedly commissioned to recognize the tree's heroism in defending Skarsgland against the demon Astaroth, whose essence they imprisoned in a soul stone. Dona was a humble man, but I imagine the painting gave him joy, and possibly even pride. All three of the painting's subjects are now dead and gone. Tragically, only Donan met his end with his honor and soul intact. Arida and Nefane both succumbed to temptations that unraveled their legacies and undid the very achievements commemorated by the painting. Now the image only serves to remind the viewer of who Arida and Nefane once were and what became of them at the end. In that way, it is a cautionary relic that feels almost haunted or cursed. Do not assume that because you have achieved greatness or performed good deeds in the past, that you are immune to evil seduction. Do not believe the lie that you are above sin. Even the most righteous may fall, given the right push in the wrong direction. The battle commemorated by the painting took place decades ago. Although not a prime evil, Astaroth was nevertheless a powerful foe, and Donan showed great courage in confronting him, as did Arida and Efane. The tree succeeded in imprisoning Astaroth in a chamber beneath Eldheim Keep, which was guarded by the Knights Penitent of the Cathedral of Light. Donan naively put his faith in the cathedral, and more so in the angel Inarius, whom the church venerates above all others. Those safeguards were not enough to stop Lilith, however, and with the help of Arida and the Fane, she freed Astaroth from his soulstone prison. In return for his liberation, Astaroth gave Lilith an ember that granted her passage through the places in hell forbidden to even one such as her. The Seal Fada is the holy text of the Druids. It tells the long story of their history, which reaches back to the firstborn sanctuary. According to legend, the Druids were once part of the northern tribes at Mount Ariad. They left behind the martial ways of that barbarian life when a man named Vasily led a small group of warrior poets into the forest to seek unity with the land. There they practiced a creed of harmony with the natural world and through their devoted study developed a powerful kinship with the living beings around them. In time, they even learned to communicate with the animals and plants. This relationship is symbolized by the talismans that druids carry and wear. Some of these emblems will look like little more than morbid scraps and trinkets to outsiders. Skulls and bones, teeth and claws, feathers and furs, all speak to the communion between the druid and the living world. In Skarsgland, they place their faith in the ground beneath their feet more than they will ever trust the high heavens. The druids have little use for angels, which is why they take a dim view of the cathedral light and its proselytizing efforts within their borders. For some time, the druids tolerated the presence of the church, but with the knights penitent marching across the moors, some are restless to see the cathedral gone. For its part, the church views the druids as primitive and superstitious. They see no light in the deep forests, the highlands, the colleges, or in the talismans the druids wear. Conflict was and is inevitable. The beauty of Skoskling is stunning and stark. Above its deep woodlands, Bare fells rise with an ancient grandeur, as if they were once monumental statues of the titans that stride pandemonium. Countless years of wind and rain and ice have worn them down to crouching. Bold moons, weary grass and heath grow in their folds, and heavy mists fill their glens. Many who wander in those highlands are never seen again, and those who return speak of voices calling to them luring them into the fog. Some are no doubt led over the edge of some precipice and dashed on the rocks below. Others are taken by wraiths and vengeful spirits. 
Still others are rumored to be swallowed by the earth itself. The folk here say that the druid, Arida, could summon this haunted mist with a tal harpa, a bowed lyre with strings of twisted horsehair. The instrument's mournful melodies carried over the hills and down into the valleys, akin to a fiddle but more primitive, singing of loneliness and loss. The mist its music accompanied seemed to reflect the state of Arida's mind. A dense fog of fear and doubt made her vulnerable to Lilith's false promises, a failing that cost her life and many others. Arida wanted to strengthen her people, except she was blind to her own weakness. Years from now, when I think back on my time in Skoskolin, I will hear the eerie cry of Arida's tell harp in my memories. The instrument survived her death, yet I do not know its present whereabouts. Weeping Cairns The entrance to this ancient druid burial complex can be found above the village of Braestig in the Skosklan Hills. Its stone doors are sealed by powerful rooms, and only by chanting the proper incantations will they open. Doing so may draw forth the unquiet dead whose spirits linger in the tombs. So any trespassing there should be undertaken only out of the greatest necessity. The druids buried in that place were heroes of legend, worthy of honor in death. They can be roused to anger if their resting place is defiled, as it was by Arida and Lilith. The bodies of intruders who ignore these cautions may be added to the collection of desiccated corpses that fill the chambers and corridors of the weeping canes. Do not blame the dead for this. Blame the living who have lost their respect for the dead. Cain Wardstones These ancient monoliths rise like the very bones of Skosklin, carved from its grey rock. They stand in silent vigil within the weeping cairns, empowered as the centuries by runes chiseled across their impassive faces. The builders of those tombs place the wardstones to guard the resting spirits of the dead. Although Lilith and Arida corrupted even these protections so that they barred passage through the tombs and incited the ghosts of vengeance. This is the power of evil. The demons of the burning hells would see every noble deed, every righteous act, all goodness in sanctuary, twisted to their vile purposes. Nothing is sacred enough to be safe. Nothing is so pure that it stands beyond their ability to desecrate it.